welcome to all of you to the DC Plus Talks. This is a series of webinars that DC Plus decided to bring to you during these special times and, and also difficult times. The idea is to discuss topic in an informal setting and we invited the speakers to take their favorite cup. Please, I invite you all to take your favorite cup and show them to the audience. And also invite all of you to take a break from the home working routine and to participate in the discussion. You can ask questions by typing into the question box. The topic of today is energy integration, which has rapidly become a buzzword, but is also a key aspect in today's energy discussion. Integrated renewables, both from an electrical and thermal sources, as well as waste heat, leads to a more flexible, efficient, and sustainable system. In this context, district heating and thermal storage can act as a local energy backbone and help balance the grid. Energy integration is a general trend and we cannot obviously cover it in one hour. So in this webinar, we will focus, it, we will focus on the market barriers and the pilot sites out of the European project magnitude which aims at increasing and optimizing synergies between electricity, gas, and heat systems. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Alessandro Provaggi, and I work at Uret Empower as head of the DC, DC Plus platform. Uret Empower is the international network for uh, district heating and cooling and the, the dc plus is the association hub for research and innovation our activities include shaping and driving knowledge and innovation for the future district energy sector promoting networking and funding opportunities for the members enabling education and training opportunities advocating for energy research policy and in general communicating on innovation and knowledge in the district energy sector so i'll show you uh the, the panelist uh with us uh we have regine bellon from edf nicole pini from eifer and paul voss from uh Yurit and Park. Uh, so, uh, the first presentation will be made jointly by Regine and Nicole, so I'll quickly present them. Uh, Regine uh, Bellom is a senior engineer in the Department Economic and Technical Analysis of the Energy Systems and uh, at the R&D division of EDF, and she's the coordinator of the Magnitude European project. And Regine, she will introduce you to the project and in general to the market barriers and the opportunities. Nicole, Nicole Pini is R&D project, uh, project manager on sustainable eating and cooling at Eifer Karlsruhe. And she's also part uh, of the project, uh, the same way uh, actually Europe Empower and DC Plus. Uh, so I just want to show uh, my cup. So this is uh, obviously an, an espresso cup, and uh, I uh, uh, I like it very much. I bought it in uh, in Lisbon, and it's really one of my favorite. Regine, what's your what's your favorite cup? Okay, uh, maybe I have to leave. Okay, do can you see? Um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so I I oops sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I could not say that this is my favorite cup, but in fact, we have uh, three cups like this with uh, Christmas characters. And in fact, it's since my son uh, took the other two and leave this one to me because he doesn't like this one. So that's why I have this one. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. And so, yeah, I let you, I let you present. You can put your presentation on, on show mode. And, and uh, yes, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to uh, speak, uh, to present the, the Magnitude project. So 
And first, the, about the agenda of the talk today. So first, I will speak about the, 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 uh, the context, the target of magnitude, consortium, the approach, and so on. Uh, then afterwards, I will uh, speak about the, the provision of flexibility uh, to the electricity system, and in particular, the services that we uh, consider in the project. And then Nicole will present the seven real-life case studies that we uh, investigate in the project. Uh, afterwards, she will speak about the technological opportunities and barriers. And she will give two examples of these real-life case studies, so ACS in, in Milan and the paris Sacré uh, case study. And then afterwards, I will come back to speak about the, the market perspectives and, uh, and some potential barrier and so on. So, first about the, the, the context and target of the Magnitude project. So, Magnitude is a H 2020 European project just uh, that started uh, uh, in October 2017. And so for, uh, well, we this is a three year and a half project. So the context, um, so we, we see that we will have uh, important evolution in the electricity system, in particular due to uh, the targets in terms of uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emission, also the, the increase increasing penetration of uh, renewable energy sources. And even if it's not the case now due to COVID-19, but uh, we might also expect some increase in electricity demand uh, due to, for example, to the penetration of electric vehicles or to electrification of some usages like uh, development of heat pump and, and things like that. And so these evolutions will lead to a new or increased uh, system risk for instance, in, term, or in terms of quality and security of supply, uh, congestion of the electricity grid, uh, system stability, curtailment, so uh, difficulty uh, to cover the electricity demand at, at some period of time. And so due to this increased risk at the level of the electricity system, we see that we need more flexibility for, for the electricity system and also a more active involvement of all the stakeholders and also um, an increased collaboration of all these stakeholders at all levels. So that's to say from the distribution level up to the, the pan-European uh, European, pan -European grids. And we also need to harness all the possible resources that we have. That's to say, uh, the, the resources that can be provided by both centralized and decentralized resources in order to provide flexibility to the electricity grid. And of course, this should be provided in a coordinated way. And when I say uh, involve both centralized and decentralized, this also means including consumers, producers, storage providers, and so on. And so that means that now we can see that we can say that synergies between the different energy vectors is, is seen as a way, uh, as a possible means to provide flexibility to the electricity system. And so in this context, the Magnitude project aims to develop a business and market mechanism, but also coordination tools. So in terms of, for example, of energy management system, aggregation platforms and, and things like that, to provide flexibility to the European electricity system. And so by increasing and optimizing the synergies between electricity, gas, heating and cooling systems. And so, Indeed, we look at energy integration, but uh, really from the perspective of providing flexibility to the electricity system, because this was the scope of the call of the Commission, and so we have to answer the, what they ask us to do. Now, a few words about the magnitude approach. Uh, so on, on the right, uh, you see, the, the let's say, the high-level uh, architecture of the project that uh, uh, I'm not going to detail it, but it, it may, following the different components, uh, you can follow also what our approach will be. So, at the level of the, the electricity system, the first step, of course, is to identify and characterize the flexibility services that can be provided by multi-energy system. 
Then at the, at the level of the, the multi-energy system, uh, an important step in the project is to uh, study and characterize the, the, the capabilities of the cross-sector technologies and multi-energy system to provide flexibility. Another step or another activity in the project is to develop models and simulate these technologies and multi-energy system and to investigate uh, optimized control strategies in order to uh, enhance or maximize the flexibility provision. Another important component in our architecture is the aggregation that you see uh, in the middle. And indeed, uh, one objective of the project is to uh, assess the benefits of pooling the flexibilities of portfolios of multi-energy system through uh, an aggregation platform that will uh, be in, uh, an intermediate between this multi-energy system and the market where uh, the, the services will be uh, proposed. We also study in the project innovative market designs, uh, mainly innovative market designs, um, well, okay. In, when I say market design, that's to say uh, at the level of the energy system, so that's to say energy, electricity market, gas market, and heat market, but we will see afterwards. And so the objective is uh, to um, propose some innovative market design, of course, to maximize the synergies and maybe some sort of coupling between these uh, markets. These will be implemented or are being implemented on a market simulation platform and they will be assessed. And then uh, finally, of course, once we have developed all our tools, uh, the objective is to assess the integrated system, that's to say multi-energy system aggregation and market platforms. And uh, an important aspect, of course, is to uh, assess the business models for the different uh, stakeholders and in particular for the multi-energy system operators and the aggregators. As a final activity, uh, we will uh, propose uh, some recommendations in terms of, course, of technological aspects, but also some policy strategy in a pan-European perspective. And in particular, since we will we rely on uh, several case studies in several countries, as Nicole will show later, and of course, relying also on the expertise of our uh, consortium uh, partners in the consortium. And so now I speak. About, I will speak about the consortium. Well, so we are uh, 16 partners from nine countries, and so you see here the different countries um, uh, of our partners. And uh, on the right, you see also the, the names of these partners. I will not go through all of them because we do not have uh, time. But uh, just to tell you that uh, in the consortium, we have, uh, of course, utilities. We have local utilities. So it's particularly important when we speak about the multi-energy system. We have solution providers for aggregation, data, market uh, platform, and so on. We have research and, and consulting organization and universities. And if we go into uh, more detailed analysis of our partners, you, we can see that you can see that uh, they are complementary in terms of expertise, and they, we actually cover the different uh, topics that we deal in the project. So that's to say the three energy sectors, so four depends. Uh, so that means electricity, gas, heating, and cooling, and uh, the technological aspect, but also the market and regulatory aspect. Now, speaking about the provision of flexibility to the electricity system, uh, which is, let's say, uh, the main uh, scope of uh, the magnitude project. Um, so it was the first step and a very important uh, activity in the project. Uh, to identify the most relevant services that uh, should be considered for the provision by multi-energy system, but from the electricity system side, so from the MICA uh, side. Oh, sorry. I... Okay, sorry. <laughs> and so we started with the key needs of the electricity system. Oh, it seems that I've lost. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. 
Uh, so we started from the key needs of the electricity system and then um, looked at the, the most relevant services that can meet these key needs. And so the first one is system adequacy and, and also incentive signals for investors. And uh, in this uh, respect, so the, 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 the services uh, that we, we have are, are the so-called capacity requirement mechanisms. Uh, the objective is to ensure that in the future we will have enough capacity to meet the, the demand. For instance, in, in, the, in the winter, uh, for the peak load in the winter, but also for other reasons, for instance, when you do not have any renewable um, producing or, or things like that. And so we have different mechanisms uh, in this respect. So, uh, for example, we have capacity markets like in France or in, uh, in the UK, uh, maybe in Italy soon. We also have uh, reserves like strategic reserves, uh, like in Sweden. Uh, we also have other mechanisms that we have studied, but that we will not consider further. For example, capacity payments like in Spain and so on. Second type of needs and services, so is uh, energy trades. So that's to say the, the, the trades between uh, sellers and buyers of energy. Uh, and there the needs is really to reduce the price risk and to optimize the energy portfolios for these stakeholders. And we have two types of mechanisms. So the their head energy market and the intraday energy market. Then we come to uh, balancing and frequency control. So that's to say the real-time balancing between generation and consumption and, and the control of frequency. And in this respect, uh, the services consist mainly in the provision of reserves for the transmission system operators. So first, well, we have two steps. First is the procurement of the reserves and then afterwards, potentially you can have the activation of this reserve it, if it is needed. And so we have mainly three types, uh, let's say frequency containment reserve, automatic frequency restoration reserve, manual frequency restoration reserve and replacement reserve. And so in the old terminology, uh, these were called, let's say, primary, secondary and tertiary uh, frequency regulation. But these are the new names that we should use now. Um, and then, of course, an important aspect when we speak about integration of renewable is the, the management of the congestion on the, the electricity grid, uh, both at transmission level and distribution levels. And so the types of services uh, in that case, so we have redispatching mechanism and uh, active power control. And so now uh, I leave the... the the floor, the phone, right, to Nicole, who will present us the, the, the seven real life case studies in the Magnitude project. So, Nicole. Yeah. Thank you, Regine. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, about the case studies. So, of course, to make energy integration happen, we need to understand what is already available because we are not going to, to rebuild the energy system from scratch. We will, um, of course, need to map. Uh, what is already available in terms of technologies, what are the existing contracts, what are the external constraints that each multi-energy system needs to face and needs to address. And from there, then we can actually derive some recommendations and some proposals for improvement. So the magnitude project in its simulations and analysis, it relies on seven project case studies. And as you see on the map, so they are located in, uh, in seven different countries which gives us very important information about different regulatory constraints. Of course, the market design in, is in some extent different in the different countries. The pro procurement processes are different, the volume of the, um, the bids, and so the flexibility that has to be offered is different. And having this diversity in terms of countries allows us to uh, compare all the different schemes and then uh, make some um, uh, proposals about the way to go to uh, maximize flexibility provision in the future. And on the other hand, as uh, this table shows, so different types of multi energy systems are represented. We have several uh, district heating networks, some like the one in Sweden and in, in uh, Milano, third generation district heating networks, so with 
high distribution temperatures. Whereas in Denmark, in Copenhagen and in Paris, we have low temperature heating networks and in Paris, it's even a hybrid network with cooling. And then we have several, several um, industrial processes like the paper mill in Austria and an industrial park in UK and a wastewater treatment plant in Spain. So this diversity um, was required to have different technologies represented in the case studies. So what we did was to map how the case study is actually structured in terms of its technological architecture, how the case study is controlled, and also what the case study is actually selling. Because of course, the flexibility provision is determined by the contracts that the multi energy system has towards the outside and uh, by the, the characteristic of the demand that it has to um, cover with the quality requirements that we have right now. So um, this slide shows very, let's say, synthetically the um, different options of sector coupling technologies we have. And in bold, we have the sector coupling technologies between electricity, heat, and gas, which are covered by the case studies uh, of the project and which are in the perimeter of the project. Um, power to gas options are unfortunately not considered here just because they were out of the scope of the call. But even if not uh, treated in this project, power to gas remains the other side of the metal uh, together with power to heat with different maturities depending on the technology. Um, but of course, um, it remains uh, an important source of flexibility. And depending on the process that the case study needs to satisfy, different technologies are available. But we have so we collected this data from the, um, the case studies and we were able then to simulate some improvement options which either with the equipment already installed or with some minor modification it enables then um, um, higher provision of flexibility from these case studies to the power grid and of course to have these changes that we propose happen, we need to have an economical interest on one side. So we analyze, as Rishin explained, the grid services and also new uh, market designs were proposed that could support flexibility provision. And on the other side, for each type of mood energy system, we propose some improvement strategies which aim at increasing the flexibility that can be actually uh, traded. And how do we do that? Well, the options are mainly three, let's say. One of them, from a technological point of view, of course, one of them is to install some additional technologies, which can be uh, power to heat technologies or storage technologies. Or we can take exactly the multi energy system ideas and see if we can adapt the control strategy still while satisfying the demand to, um, for instance, have some peak shaving or load shifting to enable the same technologies to operate in a different way and so being able to have some excess energy to, um, to provide flexibility. This has to be, of course, compatible with the boundary conditions of the case study, so to the storage capability of networks if they are connected or to the connection points between the multi energy system itself and external networks. A combination of these two um, ways of action is, let's say, inevitable sometimes because when we add or replace a technology, then we will have to adapt as well the control strategy. So once we uh, collected all this data and we started proposing some um, improvement options, we came out with actually a, a, a deeper understanding of what are the opportunities and also the current barriers for providing flexibility via sector coupling. So we see that, of course, a great potential is provided by power to heat units if we talk about support to the power system, because uh, power to heat units provide some fuel shift capabilities 
between so in the case study that we what we have um, usually so heat pumps are either decentralized or decentralized and they're usually supported also by some peak um, energy production unit and so depending on the electricity prices we could um, then optimize a fuel shift between electricity and gas to maximize then the, the, the so to uh, keep uh, the, the, the profitability of the system in mind, but to maximize also flexibility provision. And these can be taken also as re extra revenue to then repay a part of the investment that adding new technologies can, uh, can represent. A key option is, of course, heat storage. So heat storage is in the current, one, uh, the current energy system seen as, let's say, a sink of energy. But for sector coupling, it becomes really a key component because whether if it's a network, so we can use its storage capability or a real, let's say, a heat storage tank, doesn't matter. Heat storage enables, um, in a certain extent, to shift the, the, the demand or to store some of the production and so make the, the interface between the multi-energy system and the external networks much more dynamic. And then uh, for the gas fire generators that we have in the case studies, we will simulate how, the, uh, how using the gas network can as well provide flexibility and uh, to the, to the multi-energy systems itself. So while we uh, propose this technological improvement options, we have to keep in mind that all modern energy systems have contracts, they have a demand to supply, and this can become, in some extent, a, um, a barrier, but that has to be taken into account. So heat-driven systems, the heat has to be supplied with the um, uh, quality requirements that uh, are imposed. Then limitations come from the technologies themselves. So it's very important to monitor technologies properly, to always know their uh, state of, uh, of load, so that um, there are no bottlenecks represented by ramping capabilities or minimum loads or resting times for technologies. And uh, actually, uh, flexibility that we want to offer can be concretely provided. And it has to be taken care also that the cycles that the technologies have to face are not too frequent and are not too long, and in any case are compatible with maintenance costs and lifetime of the equipment. So in any case, the data availability and the interoperability between uh, assets is a key um, factor that will determine the success of the application of our models or not. In the last two slides, I want to present just shortly uh, two case studies that are in the project and more information are available on the project website. So one of them um, is the business network in Milano, managed by ACS. So it's a high temperature network with uh, heat produced by three gas engines, heat pumps, electric boilers and gas boilers for the peaks and storage tanks are already used in the production, um, uh, produ in production plant for uh, peak shading uh, in the morning. And what we are doing is to take exactly the system as it is and then simulate how the, and the system is already participating to the day ahead and the day market. And it will be simulated how the same system can actually participate to the FCR and um, AFRR and MFRR, um, um, so they can provide these uh, flexibility services. How are we going to do that? By um, an improvement of the electricity network. So at the moment, the bottleneck is actually at, uh, um, the interface between the multi energy system and the electricity network, and this will be improved. And then the heat storages will be uh, operating in a different way to optimize their use. And a very important source of flexibility is, of course, the behavior of the users. So ACS is already offering to its users the possibility to opt for um, lower net tariff and uh, so 
lower night tariff, hoping that then this will help shaving the, the morning peak of the network. And these options will be simulated and then optimized to see what can be the, the impact in terms of flexibility provision, but as well the, 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 the price of trading such, such flexibility. And on the other hand, we have in the consortium as well the case study of Paris Saclay, which is a low temperature heating and cooling network, is an extremely advanced um, concept. And, um, and in fact, uh, so it has a low temperature geothermal loop that provides heat to a, a, another secondary loop, which in turn provides heat via decentralized heat pumps uh, to the buildings and these heat pumps being reversible heat pumps, they also provide cooling where required. So in this system, the let's say renewable rate is um, very high given the geothermal uh, component and also the, um, the renewable part of the electricity used by the heat pump. And this system will be improved, let's say, in terms of flexibility provision by modeling uh, the addition of thermal storage in the substations, which will allow um, even more, let's say, demand side option and also installation of PV on site for self consumption and optimization of the energy fluxes between the heat pumps then and the buildings. So, uh, more information, of course, you can find on the project um, website. And I give the floor back to Regine for the last. Um, insights and market perspective. So, okay, so um, now I'm going to speak about the market perspective. And when I speak about markets, that's to say energy markets. Uh, so electricity markets, gas market, and maybe heat and cooling markets, even if we, okay, we will speak about that later. Um, so when we look at, um, at uh, so the, this market aspect and also the organization of the stakeholders, we can see, um, a lot of similarities between uh, the electricity, gas, heating, and cooling systems. Uh, for instance, we have in all three sectors distribution and transmission network. Well, of course, for heat, it's mainly distribution, except in, in some areas like in, in Copenhagen, for example, where you also have a transmission network. In we, for the three sectors, we have balancing requirements, so that's to say the, the, the requirements of balancing generation and consumption. We also have, we also need uh, metering and we have some requirements in terms of settlement. And when we look at the organization, in fact, we see that we have similar roles in the in the similar roles of the stakeholders in the, the, the three or four sectors. So uh, for example, we have producers, consumers, storage providers for heat, electricity, gas, and so on. And regarding the network, we have transmission network operator, distribution network operator. We have also balancing responsible parties and then depending on the, 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 the energy sector, they may be carried out by different types of stakeholders. But anyway, we have this role also. We have suppliers. We have also the different roles associated with metering. And of course, we have uh, the regulator in, in all the cases. So looking at these similarities, we, we, we can say that we, we could indeed benefit from the synergies between the three sectors, and this could help indeed the integration in the energy integration between them. But we also have very important differences. For example, we there's no unbundling in the heat sector. That's to say, for well, generally, there's no unbundling in the heat sector. So that's to say that the network roles uh, can be carried out by producers or suppliers and so on. Most often, we do not have let's say, organized market as such in the heat sector, even if in some areas like in Denmark, uh, in the Copenhagen area, again, we have some processes that are rather close to their hat and intraday uh, processes. The heat networks are inherently local systems and we can meet 
very different situation in the different countries, uh, in particular in terms of the organization of the stakeholders, in terms of the ownership of the different components and operation and so on. And finally, we have different characteristics for the regarding the, the system or the network operation and the market aspects in the three sectors. Uh, for example, regarding time constants, inherent resilience and dynamic behaviors. And of course, uh, this leads to different characteristics or different needs in terms of operation and in terms of requirements. Next. Um, now, we also have some potential market and regulatory barriers. Uh, in particular, we have a, a large diversity of market mechanism and rules uh, between countries, but also between sectors. And uh, even if we see now some harmonization efforts, in particular for the electricity system and also for the gas system, but in electricity, uh, uh, well, uh, if you look at their head and intraday energy market, uh, they are rather common now. Uh, we have some common structure, even if in some countries you may have some specificities. And presently, the, the there are also some projects launched by the, the, the TSOs regarding uh, the harmonization of uh, balancing and frequency regulation. Okay, but despite of this, we still have uh, very different rules and market mechanism in different countries. We also have in some countries some rules or requirements that prevent or limit uh, the service provision uh, by multi-energy system. And that means that we, we still do not have a level playing field uh, for, for in, in this uh, respect. Uh, for example, so the aggregation uh, is sometimes is still forbidden in some countries, in particular regarding uh, demand. Um, or uh, we might have some um, different taxes for, uh, or taxes or grid tariffs, depending on the case, uh, between the different sectors, or also uh, different grid tariffs for demand and generation. Um, we all, oh, about network tariff again. So uh, the fact that uh, in some countries we may have some uh, network tariff structure that may uh, cause increased cost when uh, you want to provide flexibility services. And it's also the same with some retail prices. Again, taxes are, may have a barrier to the provision of flexibility services. Another thing also is the imbalances, because maybe you know that you may have penalties when the system is uh, not balanced. Uh, another important aspect is the remuneration of flexibility, which may be uh, not very attractive in some countries. Um, and of course, we may have some lack of incentives uh, or incompatibility between incentive schemes. For example, lack of incentives for DSOs to procure flexibility services in some countries or between uh, the, the, the renewable energy support scheme and the flexibility provision. Uh, other aspect is the lack of coordination between uh, network operators, so between DSOs and TSOs, so in particular in electricity system, but uh, maybe in the other uh, energy field also, and of course, a lack of coordination between the network work operators in the, the, the three sectors, so electricity, gas, heating, and cooling. Indeed, the, these systems are rather operated separately. Um, and finally, something, oh, sorry, <laughs> no. Uh, another thing that maybe you, well, you, you do not think about, but we should have this in mind, is that we have a large diversity of stakeholders with very different professional culture uh, in, in the different uh, sectors. So the fact that we have a lot of stakeholders, that means that we will have a, a lot of uh, interaction of, or transaction between these, but also the fact that they have very different cultures, uh, that means that we might need some learning or training in order to understand each other and also to raise the awareness of the different problems that uh, we can meet uh, in the different sector. And then, uh, as I said, uh, 
these are generally country specific, all these barriers and so on. And an, another thing is that regulation and market design is this is really a very fast evolving field. So that's to say that you may have a regulation changing from one year to the other, changing the characteristics. So that means that we need to take into account the specificities of the three sectors and both at national and local level. And then I will finish with uh, some um, future results or let's say of the, the magnitude project just to tell you about the, the status. So this year uh, we expect to, to uh, finish the development of the optimization tools for the multi-energy system. Uh, the aggregation platform um, that will uh, indeed aggregate the portfolio of multi-energy system. Uh, the, the, the market simulation platform where we will uh, implement our innovative market design. And another activity I have not spoken about is uh, the, the specification of multi-energy uh, data hub. And uh, again, this year, uh, using all our tools, so we will uh, carry out the simulation for the seven case studies in the project, and, and uh, so in the present configuration and with improvement uh, strategies. Uh, we will also uh, study the opportunities and the barriers for the replication of uh, our solutions uh, in the different countries, and uh, then the business model evaluation. And next year, so we will have, let's say, the final, at the beginning, first quarter of the year, final uh, evaluation and recommendation. So that's to say uh, the results of the evaluation of the integrated system, so multi-energy system, aggregation, market platform, and the lessons learned and recommendation, both in terms of technological aspect and policy recommendation. Now, I would like to speak about two events. Uh, one, of course, is uh, in March uh, next year. Yeah? Yes, Regine, just to uh, see if you can do that very quickly. Uh, yes, just to tell that next yeah. year we will have our final public workshop and policy workshop. And this year, so uh, we will organize, reorganize with other project uh, conference. Uh, on the topics of modeling climate neutrality for the European Green Deal, where we will organize a sector integration session. So, thank you very much. Okay. And of course, please visit our website. Thank you, Regine. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you to really uh, both of you for, for this very interesting presentation. Now I'll, uh, I'll pass the floor uh, to, uh, to Paul because uh, Paul will introduce you to, uh, let's say, the general uh, policy discussion uh, when it comes to uh, energy integration. And Paul, may I like to ask you, since this ticketing was also uh, just also described as a local solution, how do you see this ticketing when it comes to energy integration? Because it's often uh, about, uh, let's say, big energy systems like national or Europeans. And so how do you see the district uh, eating uh, role in, in that. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi everybody. Um, thank you to the the first two speakers for making my job so much easier because uh, we've had two great experts. So I don't need to waste any of your time talking to you about what sector integration is and and how it works. What I think might be more useful for me to spend this this time on, and I'll try and be brief so there's time for questions and so on, is to talk a little bit about what sector integration uh, means for us uh, as, a, as a, an advocacy organization, a representative organization, as we try and, and do our work um, advocating for, for district heating and cooling in Brussels. The hardest part about our job is that there is kind of a fundamental tension between two of our core beliefs. Um, first of all, um, by definition, as a European association, we spend a lot of our time talking about how district heating fits into Europe's uh, energy policy objectives, how it should be a part of the Europe, European policy debate, how we deserve support and interest, and how Europe should get involved. That's one thing we say. We also talk constantly, and, and Regine uh, said it perfectly in her own remarks, about how inherently local district heating is. So there is something of a contradiction because on one hand, we want Europe to be very interested in district heating. 
then what typically happens is Europe starts to say to us, okay, but then uh, let's talk about uh, regulating district heating, let's talk about unbundling, let's talk about monopolies and consumer protection. And then very quickly, we're not so European, whoa, 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 but it's local, please uh, don't, don't interfere and so on. And while I think both of those things can be true at the same time, we, we do have and have had to make a decision. Do we want to be a purely local business uh, serving communities or do we want to be part of the story of the European energy transition? And my choice and our choice as an organization is, is, is simple. We can decide we're happy with what we have. I think district heating is 12% of the heat market right now. We can be satisfied with that or we can decide that we would like to grow. Uh, and our choice is clear, we want to grow. And that means being part of Europe's plans because Europe is increasingly influential in what happens in the um, energy transition. And, 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 and I think that our future is very limited if we limit ourselves to being a purely local solution. Then comes the question, how do you make a Europe which is used to focusing on regulating the gas and electricity markets, how do you make them care about district heating? I can tell you my, my first meetings in Brussels about district heating, were typically quite difficult because they would listen to us tell a story about the way the heat market is organized in Copenhagen and say, well, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Good luck in Copenhagen. And of course, that's not quite the, the reaction we were, we were typically looking for. So we spent time trying to find a way to capture the imagination of the European decision maker. And the most effective tool that we found uh, without any doubt is a story about sector integration. Frankly, this makes people care. The minute you say electricity and interaction with the electricity grid, people's eyes open a little bit more, they put down their phone and they start listening because there are a lot of people in this city, Brussels, who are spending all of their time right now thinking about how to resolve the problem of an energy system which increasingly relies on intermittent uh, resources and which must of course be, be, be stable and, and, and respond to demand at, at all times. So let's take Tactically speaking, we've had a real interest in pushing the story of sector integration, energy system integration, and the role of district heating therein. And it's been quite effective for us. Um, in the recent Renewable Energy Directive, and even more recently in the ongoing EU level discussion about uh, so-called smart sector integration, district heating is emerging as a European topic um, in, in policy and also in, in questions around financing of European energy infrastructure. If heat networks are a useful tool for balancing the electricity grid, then suddenly they move from being a purely local uh, solution to a, a European strategic asset that should be promoted, supported, maintained uh, and, uh, and encouraged. So that's really good for us. That's one thing, but it's more than just tactics. I think also um, there's a lot of good sense in this, and, and you heard it translated from, from principle into practice just now by both Nicole and, and Regine. It's good sense. And you see there's a, I think you can see a slide here. This is our sort of um, standard image now for presenting district heating as we want people to think about it. Not an old coal plant somewhere in China, but it's part of an integrated energy system linked to the power grid, also producing a, a providing a route to market for green gas where it makes sense. And if we're going to deliver on our promises, and by the way, as an industry, we've committed to full decarbonization of our networks before 2050. In some countries, it will be much sooner. In other countries, I think it might be tight. But I know there's no way we're able to deliver on this promise if we don't have this interaction with the grid. So we can help the electricity grid, but the electricity grid also helps us by providing a, a low carbon or increasingly low carbon uh, fuel for our networks. And I'd like to take a moment to thank um, DHG Plus, so Alessandro and, and, and his team who are, who are really a joy to work with on these things because they have their own ideas and just as importantly, they bring in people like Regine and Nicole and I'm sure many of you who are on the line right now who are doing this superb work, you know, both the projects themselves and the case studies that they lead to. You know, I was really inspired just now listening to Nicole talk about what's happening in Milano. I don't think enough people know these things. And we as a, as a, let's say, simple advocacy organization, you know, we can repeat our messages and we can knock on the right doors in Brussels, but that doesn't substitute um, the, the real work of learning and, and discovery that is possible thanks to these projects and these people. And now, I'm really happy to say that sector integration and district heating is, is really a live issue. I'm on the phone every day at the moment with the European Commission, talking to them about how this works. 
I spent an hour on the phone with uh, my counterpart, the CEO of NSOE, um, two nights ago, talking about how district heating and the electricity grid can work together um, in the framework of the Connecting Europe facility and generally in the, in the development of an infrastructure system that is fit for purpose when it comes to decarbonization. So these things fit together wonderfully. I've never been more optimistic about the future of our sector. And a big, part, a big, a big reason for that is because we're no longer going to think of ourselves as isolated islands in cities around Europe, but rather as, as, as part of the system and I hope part of the solution. Okay, I'm going to shut up now so that we have some time for questions and so on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, do you maybe, by the way, do you want to show, uh, Paul, your cup and then also, Nicole, do you want to show yours? Because we didn't do it. So, two, two sure. things to say about this cup. One, it, uh, it says, I love you, Daddy, somewhat idiosyncratically written and spelled. But if I'm honest, I don't know which of my children gave it to me, and I'm afraid to ask them because they're going to have hurt feelings. I know it was one of the two older ones because the baby's not doing anything, but uh, whichever one of them made it is very precious to me. Nice. Nice. Uh, Nicole? Yeah, my cup is, was given as a present by colleagues, so this is like the unstealable cup because in its ugliness it's cute. And so it's a Nicole cup with a kind of very happy unicorn. And yeah, well, uh, nobody stole it until now, so it works. Okay, okay, very good. So now is the time for the uh, audience. We uh, prepared uh, two questions, two actually two polls. So uh, they should come on the screen uh, very soon. Uh, if you just give us some time, um, do you? I don't know if you see them. No. Uh, yeah. Do you see the the polls? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, very good. I don't see them, but uh, uh, maybe um, I don't like if it's all of you can see them. That's that's great. So, um, so uh, the question should be: What is the biggest barrier to energy integration? And here you have uh, different. Uh, let's say uh, replies and you invited to answer to one uh, so it can be the market barriers uh, let's say more like for example lack of dynamic tariffs uh, lack of investment so a money uh, problem uh, just we just need to inject more more let's say more investment more money uh, limited integrated planning uh, limited coordination between the different stakeholders the electricity and uh, the, the heat and the gas and so on, or more technical and technological uh, barriers. So you have uh, 20 seconds to uh, reply. And so uh, I'll just I'll just have a small technical issues because I cannot see myself uh, the poll, so maybe I can ask uh, Paul, Paul to comment on them and tell me what, what they look like. Uh, well, I can see them. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't see them anymore. They left. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, now I have the answers. Uh, okay, so we have a clear winner, 68% lack of coordination and integrated planning. And I wasn't allowed to vote, but for what it's worth, I would definitely have agreed. Uh, second, market barriers. And, and uh, third, lack of investments. And nobody sees technical or technological barriers, uh, which tells me we have a knowledgeable group of people on the line. This is all about coordination and planning in my view. Okay, that, that's very interesting. Do you have uh, any comments also, Regine uh, and uh, Nicole, about, about this? Yeah, well, I would agree completely because so um, we see also from, from magnitude 
that from a technological point of view, there are technologies that can make it. And then what is really important is really the interoperability between systems. So the, the data sharing, the way the, uh, systems are monitored, but especially the communication between stakeholders. So, um, which is very often lacking. So, um, yeah, I would have voted. Okay. Regine, do you have any comment? Or um, Yes, maybe I, I have some. Okay, I, I fully agree with the lack of coordination because, in, indeed, this is something that we have found in the project. But I think that, okay, market barriers or regulatory barriers are also very important. So maybe I would have chosen both if, if I had to vote. Uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, they are the, the two top one in, the, in your poll, so it's okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I uh, I think we can move to the uh, next uh, poll, and uh, I I still uh, ask you uh, Paul to help me because I can I cannot I cannot see the uh, the quest the question, but it should be about what is the most important level of governance to address energy integration aspects. So uh, well, the the problems and and the solutions should, are. Uh, should be addressed at city level, at region level, at national level, or at EU level. And uh, please, please uh, take some time to reply. And uh, obviously, uh, there is not maybe one single perfect reply, but this is also to uh, to a bit animate a bit the discussion and to see your answers. And then, when we are ready, Paula would ask you to uh, to to say out loud what what are the results. Sure. Okay, are we are we ready? I think we can close the poll. Paul, do you see the answers? Yep. Uh, so it's much tighter. Uh, uh, so regional level comes first, but it's close. After that, national level, after that, city level, and then EU level. But to be honest, the percentages are so close that I think the only message here is you need all four. Okay. But that's also an interesting message also for, for, for us working more at EU level and also at the same time try to uh, let's say to to uh, enable uh, uh, the city in the regions uh, to get coordinated. Uh, what's what, what do, do the speakers have have uh, let's say an opinion or something they would like to to comment? What I would say about this is 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 <clears throat> actually the need for system integration is mirrored by a need for integration at, at the governance level. You know, the, 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 these things. Um, just as you need an integrated approach to energy systems, you need an integrated approach to governance where what the EU is trying to do um, matches with what people closer to the ground are trying to accomplish. Okay. Uh, and Nicole and Regine, do you? Yeah, uh, I agree on the on the need of, um, of coordination on all the four levels. For me, what is really a key thing is that all the stakeholders involved see, let's say, a benefit from continuing with sector coupling. So sector coupling means that all sectors are actually real coupled, right? So there is no uh, sector that leads and the others that are used at, let's say, sinks, but all sectors see an interest in, uh, in contributing to this and in sharing data and in uh, creating this, uh, this synergies concretely. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you to all. Uh, we do, uh, so now is also time for questions. So we already received, uh, uh, let's say, several questions. So uh, we see if we have time to answer them all. Uh, but let's say I will start shooting uh, the, first, uh, the first one and, and then see how it goes. So uh, we have a question on actually on the wasted component because um, it's also part of the picture of energy integration. So uh, maybe I'll start 
to to answer the, the to ask the question to Paul. How, how do you do you see the waste heat in the overall energy integration uh, picture? And then for the others too, if they they want to add. Yeah, it's it's an important question. I, I think it's it's an area that's been a little bit neglected in the discussion today, just because I, I think a lot of us had power to heat applications in mind. But I know that from the European Commission's perspective, a big part of the sector integration discussion is the idea of a circular economy. And I can tell you that the, the, the politicians get very excited by the idea of using waste heat from something like a data center because it sounds modern, sounds like a good idea, sounds, uh, sounds, uh, sounds almost too good to be true. Uh, the big thing about the waste heat discussion will be to make sure that it's not just a sort of cover for continuing to burn fossil fuels and, 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 and calling that waste heat if it's in a CHP plant or something. This tends to upset people. But let's say genuine waste heat that comes from a productive economic activity of one type or another and then can be used um, to heat a building. But that's, that's wonderful news and, and belongs um, every bit as much as, as anything else at the center of the sector integration discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, anything else that, that Nicola Regine you would like to add? Yeah, maybe if we take just the case studies of magnitude, for instance, we didn't talk about it today, but in the wastewater treatment plant, there is the waste heat produced by the biogas cogenerator that is used to actually um, lower the extra consumption to keeping the, the, the heat level at where it has to be. The paper mill is injecting waste heat to the local distributing network. And also, in any case, decentralized heat pumps, they need a heat source. So if there is waste heat, then it will mean that all this equipment will actually work at higher efficiency. So it's definitely a key for uh, connecting uh, heating and electricity sector. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, Regine, there is anything you want to add, or otherwise I can pass to the next question. Uh, uh, no, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then uh, I'll merge two questions that uh, they are quite similar in my view. So one is, uh, what are the attention points for starting district heating grids if they want to be ready for energy integration? And then there is another one, uh, if you have best practices, like good cases in Europe you want to share. So um, who would like to take this question? One, one, one or two of these questions. Um, so I suppose that, for example, the attention point for starting district heating grids ready for energy integration I think it, it comes, it's a lot about planning, I, I, I would say. Uh, so do, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, for me, it, it comes a lot about planning. What we see is what is really important is it's not ultimately going to make a very complex system because then it's kind of expensive. But uh, put the uh, energy management system in place to enable centralized, so centralized control of decentralized equipment. Basically, you can trade flexibility only if you know what is the state of your system. And so you need to make sure that the, system, the state of your system is known. And usually this represents just a minor investment compared to all the rest of the system. And then data availability, because of course you need data to make diagnosis, to see also if there are some unexpected behavior and to make sure, because this is super important, that the customers receive the service at the quality level that they, they, they signed for and that needs to be ensured. So um, it's really for me on the interoperability and communication layer where the biggest difference compared to the system of today is and uh, maybe a, be a better understanding of the network itself. So not just production and demand, but really the distribution part needs to be to be known to then exploit it and avoid having to install extra storage for that. Okay, great. Regine, Paul, any other comment or? 
No, well, uh, then uh, maybe the, the other part of the question, the second question was about uh, best practices. If we have more more best practices, and this is, uh, uh, you know, something that we, we hear often. So, uh, I mean, for, for my side, uh, apart from the two that we explained, probably the, also the, the, the other uh, remaining case studies of magnitude. Uh, I don't know, again, if Nicole, you want to say anything on that, and maybe if the others have, it can start think uh, thinking about uh, other uh, best practices or or cities where they see that energy integration is really uh, already uh, uh, at least partially a reality. So first Nicole and then the others. Yeah, well, um, let's say for me the the, the case studies I presented are uh, in a in a way. Because also they represent two different starting points. So it's not uh, feasible to imagine to lower all the distribution temperatures of network at once or to install decentralized heat pumps everywhere because the buildings are not uh, able to, to, to make the integration of heat pumps feasible now. So what is very important is to focus on the system that we have now and then customize the answer to its characteristics. So for instance, the, the the case of Milano for me is a best practice in the sense that they are trying to make their best with what they have and they're also insisting on the pricing schemes of making them more advanced and of bringing on board the users. So to find not only technological levers but also um, really changing the prices to make people participate to, to the, the, the change of the network and to the sector integration actively. And then, um, of course, all the, the new projects in the north of Europe, but also what I presented in, a, in, a, in Sacré, of having low temperature networks which use as much as possible uh, renewables and source and waste heat, and also valorizing some um, equipment which can produce cooling and heating at the same time. Because, of course, so we see that the heat demand is decreasing. So anywhere where we can use a part of this heat in summer to produce cooling, this is for me an interesting solution because it will make yeah. all the system run longer and so the overall costs for the operators and for the users lower. Uh, okay, uh, any other ideas for best practices around Europe? I think there's, uh, I mean, two two examples to 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 avoid Denmark, uh, which I think has been mentioned once or twice. Or um, there there are there are really interesting projects uh, up and running already in Berlin and in Helsinki, um, where you can see all this uh, happening as as daily business uh, already. I'd recommend them both. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, or the case of Vienna, for example, uh, yeah. comes to my mind. Um, we do uh, maybe have a last question since is uh, already uh, we already let's say it's already three uh, ten. Um, can you provide more information about the optimization tool you are developing? So that's a question more for the magnitude uh, people. What does it do? What what this tool, uh, What does the tool do exactly? The question either for Regine or Nicole. Uh... Okay, so in in fact, in uh, so in the magnitude project, we have several tools that we have. So uh, some tools are really at the level of the multi-energy system, and so the, the the energy management of the different technologies that you can have on the site, for example, uh, for for example, for the ECS uh, district heating uh, system. So they they are developing uh, an energy management system in order to optimize uh, the the the, the the operation of the different technologies in order to both meet the needs of the consumers in terms of heat, but at the same time to provide flexibility services to the uh, electricity grid. So these, these are the first type of tools that we have. Second type, we also develop an aggregation platform. So the idea is really to aggregate portfolios of multi-energy system, but not only, maybe other types types of resources or distributed resources in order to really have a portfolio of different uh, resources that have different characteristics and that 
will provide some backups also uh, to 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 when uh, they will make some uh, bits on the market and so in terms of these aggregation platforms there are several modules being developed for example one module is about the forecasting of market price it's something very important to 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 know in order to make the bits to the right market at the right time uh, another one is also forecasting the flexibility of the portfolio of resources so so multi energy system and so on and of course all this optimization uh, aspects in the aggregation platform in order to 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 build the, the bits that will be proposed so this is the second type of tools and uh, then uh, the other tools that we are uh, developing is indeed this market simulation platform where uh, we are implementing uh, now some innovative market uh, design uh, where we we consider in some way some couplings uh, or some yes some couplings between uh, the electricity markets gas market and we are also thinking of possible future heat markets does it answer okay. the question i i i think so uh, so there are, I think, two remaining questions, but we will send the questions to uh, to the to the speaker. So if uh, if then can can answer, let's say by email. Uh, so the the time is up. I think it was extremely interesting, and I would really like to to thank uh, really the, the three of you. Uh, I uh, would like to remind the, uh, everybody that this is part of a series of, of webinars. So you can join us next week at the, the same day, at the same time. It's on, on Thursday at 2 o'clock. And next, uh, next week, we will talk about uh, uh, district heating uh, networks uh, up, upgrade. So and uh, if you want to see uh, the, the slides again, and actually the whole registration, the, the recording uh, of, the, uh, of this webinar, you can go on uh, uh, the website link that you see on the screen. So uh, with that, again, I would like to, to thank all of you to, uh, for participating to the, uh, to the webinars and a special thanks to uh, our speakers. And uh, have a good uh, rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much thank to you. all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. you. Bye. Bye.